Hi, this is the man from Modesto, and I'm going to hopefully quickly go through 10 points, 10 things that I think that atheists, at least uh, proactive evangelizing atheists, don't really seem to respect or care about. Now, the first one is the notion of eternal life. Eternal life is something that exists independent of any uh, contemporary religious organization of any type, variety, size, culture, or creed. Eternal life is going to exist long after uh, I'm gone, long after you're gone, long after people are gone from this earth. Uh, eternal life will be. It's a thing. And most people on the planet believe in it. I'm not trying to make an ad populum fallacious argument. What I am saying is, it's so widely understood, observed, recognized, and reported experientially by people that it's very interesting. And if somebody's telling me like, hey, there's a life after this one that lasts not, you know, somewhere between 70 and 120 years, but instead, you know, lasts forever, that's extremely interesting. And I think that any common sense person would invest some time researching why that is believed by others and trying to dis determine if it can be believed or not. So that's the first thing atheists don't seem to care about, eternal life. Second thing, the existence of Satan. This is extremely important when uh, someone goes out and says, you know, this is what I reject and this is what I receive. You have to understand that there is a Satan, there's, an, there's a son of Satan, and there's also an unholy spirit. And they have followers and adherents. Some of them don't understand that the voice, the ideas entering their mind are not their own, but originate from an unholy spirit that prompts them to go out and do things. They don't understand, the atheist doesn't seem to understand that there are people who worship Satan and follow him. There are a few who are open about it. There are satanic churches and there's even the Air Force Academy now recognizes, you know, there's a place for Satanists to worship on their campus, right? There are real Satanists, but their numbers are far greater than you assume. Some organizations, secret society organizations, are entirely avowed Satanists. They don't say that in their literature, but their oaths include that. There are others that are only at the very top, are run by Satanists. And many, okay, now I'm going to get to that in number four. Okay, next, number three. So, so again, to sum up number two, there are Satanists and their goal is to keep you away from Jesus. They do not want you to go to Jesus. Uh, they themselves believe that Christians are evil. That's an idea they try to spread out. They have people, you recognize them as trolls, who go around just creating trouble because that pleases Satan. There's a spirit that enters them and they don't have peace unless they cause trouble for someone else. I'll say that again. The person possessed by an evil spirit will not have peace until they've insulted someone else, yelled at someone, attempted to bring someone down and say, ha, yeah, you know, and then I said, blah, 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 ha, ha, ha. You know, and their friends, their like-spirited friends, their colleagues, their compatriots, all who support one another, maybe even love one another, they giggle and laugh and say, yeah, well done. It's a spirit that exists in them. This is something Satanists don't, I mean, sorry, atheists don't seem to understand, is that there are spirits out there, there are people who work in obedience to those spirits, knowingly and unwittingly. Number three, uh, the power of God's promises. The power of God's promises is such that uh, you can observe it in the world. The scriptures say, if you want to succeed, work hard. It's a principle that God put into existence. If you will work hard, you will achieve success. Now, there are other things you need to do. You can't also be lying and cheating and harming others because God won't support that. God's law also says, if you live that way, you will be brought down. You will be humbled. But hard work begets success. That's, that's God's principle. The next principle is the golden rule. Now, these are things that support the existence of God. The golden rule says, whatever you do to other people, that's what will happen to you. Now, in Christianity, we have what I call a top-down system, where God created everything, and he explains to us, he explains to us, this is how it works. This is, these are the rules. Don't do this, 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 and this, and this, 
And if you do, these are the kind of penalties that will happen to you. If someone does good to you and you do evil to them in response, evil will never leave your house. If you bless Israel, I will bless you. If you curse Israel, I will curse you. If you disobey my commands and reject uh, my salvation plan, I will kill off your cattle, they will not prosper, and I will turn your land into desert. So look around the world, do you see that as fact or just some mythical claim? Next, uh, creation. This is uh, poorly explained by Christians, I apologize. There's an analogy that says, you can see a painting, you know there's a painter. You see the world, you know there's a creator. Creation implies creator, painting implies painter. Uh, this is a very weak analogy. The Holy Spirit explained to me in a dream that this is a severely deficient, even misleading analogy because in the scripture it says, on judgment day, even the mere existence of the world will testify against those who rejected God. The Holy Spirit showed me in a dream, this is a short understanding. The fullness of it is that all of the principles that bind everything together, things that we have observed, again, kind of a ground up way, uh, the laws of physics, the laws of chemistry, the law of karma, the golden rule, right? These things prove the existence of God. All those things we can observe, you don't understand how they work. Um, God created, the scripture tells us that if you will speak badly about someone, the next time that person enters the room where you are, they will know that you spoke badly about them. How many times have you experienced that? You walk into a room and you know, oh, some people have been speaking about me. Or maybe you're not even in the same room. Oh, some people are, someone's talking about me now. You walk into the room, you know, you can even know like it was her. And you see her and maybe she looks at you and her face does one of these, you know, because she knows it as well. That is a spiritual principle. You receive it in the spirit. Now, you might have some mental reasoning, some untrue uh, principle, guiding principle that says no one can know that. And so you reject it. How many times have you met someone and instantly you knew this is a bad guy? Oh, this girl is untrustworthy. You knew that via the spirit. But your mind said, no, 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 I need to treat people fairly and judge them on their actions. The person begins telling you, oh, I'm a guy who likes to do this. I always help my friends and this and that. And later, the guy stabs you in the back, cheats you on, every, on a big business deal. And then you remember, you know, when I met him, how many times have you heard this? When I met him, I knew he was a bad guy and I dated him anyway. When I met her, I knew that she was lascivious, but I let her into my uh, inner circle anyway. You know? And usually it's because of words they use. So things people can deceive by the tongue, but the spirit perceives the truth. That's something you can learn to observe. So creation, not just the physical existence of it, but the way that creation is held together, the way that creation moves forward, the way that we are able to know things that there is not a physical understanding of, these are things that testify to the existence of someone who created order. The next thing is that Christians are imperfect. I think, uh, of course, there are in many ways, the atheists can look at Christians and say, wow, these people are really getting it wrong. Yeah, in many ways we get things wrong. I get stuff wrong. I enjoy correction because I want to understand things better and I want to be a better person. So when someone corrects me, you know, I can, if, if, if I agree with them, I can receive it easily. Sometimes people accuse you of something and it's just irrelevant to anything, but, uh, it's important to understand that Christians aren't perfect. So uh, the media, they love to uh, bring forth of the worst kinds of Christians. And um, uh, Westboro Baptist, these guys, they're always getting a lot of media coverage. But they do not represent the heart of Christ. They do not represent uh, the best face of a Christian. They may do a few good things here and there, but I don't know about it. All I see is them doing things that the Holy Spirit has specifically told me to not do. This Holy Spirit has told me like, if someone is out doing their evil thing, don't go and get in their face and tell them you need Jesus. If you want, he said, you can go across the street and put up a sign and sit there quietly and if someone is led, they can come to you. But you don't go get in their face. All that does is make is increase people's resistance to Christ, resistance to coming to Jesus. 
It strengthens their attitude to push back. So anyway, the next thing Christian, I mean, sorry, atheists don't seem to uh, really understand or respect is the origin of life. Like this is an important point that the atheist must be able to explain, the origin of life. Many times I see in a, in a conversation between a Christian and an atheist that the Christian and the atheist will agree that, well, you know, we're both equal because, you know, I can't explain the origin of God. I can't. And the atheist admits that he can't explain the origin of matter. He says there was a big bang, but where that compressed initial ball came from, I don't know. So I guess we're even on this, so let's just agree on that and move on. Again, the Holy Spirit showed me a dream. No, there's not equality in this because the Christian can't explain the origin of God. And then his explanation moves forward from there. God created things and God gave them life, right? So I have one thing I can't explain, the origin of a God who can create things and can create life. The atheist can't explain the beginning of matter and then he also cannot explain how matter became living. So he has two things he can't explain. So if you want to uh, measure or quantify the inability to explain, uh, the atheist position is a factor of two uh, weaker, if you think that's important. But in science, we should accept that there are things that go on that you can't explain, but the atheist likes to say, you know, we're equal in this regard, they're, they're not equal. So the origin of life is something. There's no such thing as abiogenesis. When I grew up, they taught us about, you know, how people in the dark ages believed that flies came from cheese and mice came from dust in the corner because they, these things were observed together in different times. And that was the dark ages belief, you know, simple observation and a conclusion without any kind of experimentation. But later experimentation showed that uh, this is not how mice are originated and it's not how flies come about. <clears throat> but instead mice come only from other mice and flies come only from other flies. That life begets like, like begets like. That a mouse gives a mouse, a cat gives a cat, a bear gives a bear, and so on and so forth. That's what we can observe, and that's what we are able to believe. Now, next, uh, the old given enough time, are you? Well, given enough time. Well, you know, this doesn't really make sense. Well, given enough time. Given enough time is the yo mama, is the yo mama of the evolution discussion. The yo mama works like this. You're on the playground, and here's two groups of guys, and uh, they get into a little bit of a uh, confrontation a little bit, and they just start insulting one another. And this guy, uh, number one, he's throwing out some really uh, humorous insults, and you're laughing at him. And the other guy just says, yo mama, and the, 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 you know, number one comes out with another really good insult, and the other guy just sticks with yo mama, yo mama, and then his friends start supporting him. <laughs> yeah, he said yo mama. And that's all they say is yo mama. That's it. So given enough time is the yo mama. Given enough time just says, well, you don't know. What if, you know, there was, you know, a trillion years? You, you don't know. You don't know. So first of all, the first reason that that is just a yo mama, it's just something somebody says, and it's not supporting, it doesn't really prove anything, and it's even valueless, and uh, it kind of shows a lack of creativity on the person using the yo mama slash given enough time argument or retort is that uh, you have, really have to extrapolate. And extrapolation is a kind of a thing that in true science, practical science, uh, is only used with some kind of reason that you should be able to believe that. You know? And it's always said, you know, as to, well, this data was extrapolated beyond the experimental data. You know, this conclusion is an extrapolation. If you want to interpolate, even sometimes in some data collections, interpolation is not allowed. And other times, you can interpolate. Well, you know, I didn't measure every single value, but, you know, I can draw a straight line, I can, you know, calculate the slope, and I can calculate, you know, at this other value, I've never experimentally measured, I can guess that this is gonna be, you know, the value, plus or minus 0.02 or something, right? So you can interpolate, totally legitimate, but when you extrapolate, and especially if you say, well, I can see, you know, whatever, I don't know how many light years they've been able to take some kind of an observation. But let's say that it's just like 10 units. I'm making up my own scale so you can't challenge it, just to get past that. Let's say it's 10 units that we can observe, that humanity can observe, it's 10. But the actual span of all of existence, the cosmos, what is it? How much is it? 
a thousand. So, so a thousand minus ten. There's another nine hundred and ninety. How do you know that the same physical observations we make here, the laws that we describe with the Newtonian, with the Newtonian math, how do we know that those exist in the other place? How do we know there aren't other kinds of bodies in greater density, someplace way over that way, you know, two hundred and fifty units using my system, 250 units, way over there, how do we know there aren't some different magnetic field interactions that produce different properties? How do you know that there's not some threshold at some distance where everything that was in front of you suddenly becomes behind you and you just get folded inside out and you have a different experience? You know, How do you know? I don't know that. Probably that is it. I don't have any reason to think that's it, other than creative thinking. That's the only reason. That's the only reason I'm giving that example, but you don't know. And that's what the given enough time argument is. But here's the second reason, and this is a really big reason. I'm gonna, I propose to you this. Given enough time, there could be created a whole sentient existence. And in that existence, at some point, maybe in the middle, maybe toward the end, some guy achieves consciousness beyond the physical form. Or maybe a group and they all merge and become one. I don't know, I'm just making this up. I'm just saying given enough time, you know, that could have happened. That whole thing comes to an end at some point because the universe you know, re-imploded or something, you know, let's just say theoretically, and uh, then re-expanded, and that's our existence. But this, uh, or, no, no, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that this existence then recreated everything himself. He was, you know, given enough time so long there that he learned how to mentally interact with physical things and created a whole cosmos because he was bored, because he needed to do something to be entertained, or because he found that that increased him somehow. I don't know, I don't care. But given enough time, that could happen. And that's the guy that we know as God. So given enough time, stuff could create God. Random events could create God. So given enough time, God could exist. It's a real simple argument. It's just a yo mama. It doesn't really have any power, and you should never ever use it again to support evolution or entropy or anything else. I'm sorry, the, uh, the supported uh, conclusion of the theory of entropy, which some people uh, completely irrationally proclaim, uh, defies the existence of God and proclaims that you know eventually everything will end and there can be no God, which I've never seen somebody explain you know, all their premises and their conclusion, so therefore there's no God. But people just say, oh, because entropy, because second law of thermodynamics, there's no God. Ridiculous. It's a, it's a yo mama. Okay, so next, uh, Jesus loves you. This is something atheists don't seem to understand. Jesus loves me, yes, he also loves you. The scripture says it explains God's uh, opinion on the matter. God loved us when we were yet sinners, when we were still uh, doing everything wrong without acknowledging that it was wrong, without any kind of repentance, ignoring God, uh, doing everything wrong before we received salvation through Jesus, right? God still loved us then. That's every atheist, every non-Jesus uh, proclaiming Christian, that's that person. God loves us all. Now, he doesn't like the idea that you reject him, that's for sure. I mean, what if uh, you loved someone and that person did not return your love? You would still love the person, but you wouldn't like the idea that they didn't return your love. And there might even be some things, even though you love that person, there might be some things about them. Uh, they don't brush their teeth enough. They leave their stuff laying around. Uh, they do uh, you know, only 90% of what they ought to do in their job. Maybe you don't respect that. Maybe you don't even like it, but you still love them. And God has that same attitude toward you. He may not like everything I do, but he loves me. He may not like everything you do, but he loves you. This thing you need to understand. The next thing is uh, research. Oh boy, wow, there's so many times I, I see this problem. Uh, and really, I think it's, it's really intrinsic to the fact that you remain atheist. I think there are many people who are hardworking scientists with, who carefully applied their scientific values and their scientific understanding and eventually concluded, yeah, there's God. There's one guy who went out and he said, I'm going to disprove God. I'm going to take all the descriptions in the Bible about, you know, we traveled, you know, we walked, two days from this city and we arrived at this city and then we left from there and went to this city. Well, these two still exist, so this other one should be around here somewhere. And then the guy goes there and he finds, boom, there's a city there. And he becomes a famous archeologist for locating all of these lost cities and digging them up. And he knew where they were because of 
the account of where they existed in biblical history. So if you do your research, you will find that the Bible is an accurate historical record. It's a, they are, it's a collection of historical documents. And you will find that God is real and that the people's testimonies, you will find there's a lot of proof. There are videos of feet growing out. I myself have been in the room. I'm giving you my own testimony and it's unfortunately popular rather than just to research and consider what is observed, to make observations and observe it. People just reject it. You know, it's the equivalent of saying, no, you're just lying. A hundred million people are lying. A hundred million people to have, you know, anywhere from 10 to a thousand stories of God doing something, they're all just lies. You know, that's, that's, if you think that's a bad argument, then you need to do some research. Okay, the other thing about research that, uh, again, this comes back to the Satanists, there is disinformation in research. A few years ago, some men claimed, hey, we found the gay gene. Later, uh, they admitted that they only did it because they wanted to put a, a, a spike in the heart of Christianity and that they completely made up their data, that it was just completely a lie. Uh, I believe all three men are banned from ever working in science again. I, I don't know because I didn't research that carefully. I mean, I didn't research their career paths. But that's what happened. There, and there are many, many other examples. There's a lot of disinformation. Uh, one reason that people, one thing people bring up when they mock the Bible is say, oh, the Bible talks about giants. Oh, oh, yeah, today we still see some very tall people, but, you know, it's just a pituitary problem. So we are told. I didn't go give an x-ray on the guy and look at his pituitary and see that there's a tumor there. I didn't do that. The Bible also says there are people with six, hand, six fingers and six toes. Go do a Google image search. You will find that there are people alive today who have six fingers, work totally normally, and who have six toes. And if you do a really aggressive search, as I have done, you will find that what happens to these large skeletons when they're found is that uh, they are bought up by a particular family who are widely involved uh, via sponsoring internships, via financing entire museums, and they buy up these skeletons. And you also find um, that uh, there was a famous park owner who went to jail for uh, an alleged uh, violation of a tax law, which was never intended to apply to someone withdrawing their own money to pay their own bills, uh, that this person had acquired components of a giant skeleton and was planning to put them on display when he was suddenly uh, raided by the IRS uh, special forces, effectively, and uh, whisked off to jail. So, and they also made a great effort to seize all of his property. Of course, they want to own those bones. So this is an important thing because they, this is what, go look at um, Darwin's original papers. When he was in South America, Darwin encountered giants and he wrote about it. I, I remember one thing he was interested in was the fact that these giants wore very little clothing, but there was snow on the ground. It was extremely cold. He didn't understand how they could be so hot. Well, probably they weren't running on glycolysis, but they're probably running on ketosis. They're having a high fat diet. So you'd expect plants and animals living in a cold environment to have a lot of fat. So it kind of makes sense, right? So you could explain that a little bit. It makes sense with what, with more modern understanding in biology, something that uh, uh, in Darwin's time they didn't talk about, glycolysis or, you know, versus uh, ketosis, you know, energy burning. <clears throat> anyway, giants are well documented. You can go look now, again, disinformation and information uh, seclusion information control. So there's a lot of disinformation in science and you need to understand that that exists. So when you research, you have to be able to assess, did this guy properly format his experiment? Did this person properly apply statistics? Uh, did this person, are his conclusions valid? You need, you know, a philosophical, a logical uh, skill set and a practical skill set, uh, some kind of clinical experience and understanding to go and really read a scientific publication and decide if it's legitimate or not. So research is important. The ninth thing that atheists don't seem to care about is how important is IQ? There's a, a too popular um, standpoint amongst the atheists that, well, we're superior to Christians because we're more intelligent. And our decision to reject God is the more intelligent decision. You know, 
ipso facto because we're more intelligent. So uh, this, of course, is a, a ridiculous argument, and you know, just at face value, it seems silly. But the other point is that when they come to support that, they often refer back to studies of IQ or average IQs of populations. Now, I'm not sure that this data has been collected fairly or has been uh, interpreted fairly or accurately. Uh, I don't agree with that. I don't accept it. <clears throat> it may be true. It may be true. You know, there are, you know, just as a thinking person, I can look at it and say, well, I could see why that might be. You know, it could be true. But does it have any meaning as to who is right? No, it's an appeal to authority, or in this case, a kind of an appeal to credential, a appeal to past experience. It's an appeal to, you know, uh, 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 the work of the past. Well, we went and got a college degree, so, you know, we perform better on IQ tests. But IQ, here's the thing that you need to know. IQ is not in any way a good predictor of life success. Not by, not by several metrics, not by financial income, not by career maximum uh, level achieved. You know, IQ doesn't predict these kinds of things. What does predict career success and financial success is emotional quotient, the EQ. Someone's ability to be in a confrontational situation and maintain their cool. <clears throat> someone's ability to enter a hostile debate and stay calm. That's an emotional quotient. And in my personal experience, the people who have the most peace are the Christians. On the battlefield, you're standing in a circle and they're telling you, like, this is our mission, these are the orders we just received. And your commander is giving the orders. <clears throat> and you look around the group, and the three guys that are in your prayer chain are all nodding their head. All right, yeah, I understand, I'm following. Okay, okay, what more? And then you look at the other guys, who are non-praying Christians or non-Christians and their faces are ghost white. They're terrified, we're gonna do that. The Christians have the most peace. We understand that I am in God's hand and wherever I go, it doesn't matter, live or die. All that matters is that I am within God's will for this moment, for this day, for this life, for this phase of my lifetime. <clears throat> so. Don't make the IQ argument. It doesn't get anywhere. There's no merit in it. It doesn't have any logic to support it. The IQ argument is made too often, and it seems like atheists just don't care about the proper application of logic or reason. When they say, well, we're, more, we're smarter than you, and you know, therefore, our decision is correct. Our uh, estimation of the situation on this topic is correct. It's, it's not a legitimate argument. Uh, next, uh, that science is untrustworthy at the level of eternity. Again, I, there are so many errors with science, so many things that are done wrong. You need to understand, let me just give you this. Go and read a book called Statistics Done Wrong. This book is great. Uh, I think every person who has any kind of a scientific inclination, uh, if you're in the sciences in college right now, or if you already have a degree, if you're working in the sciences somewhere, as a technician or as a licensed professional. You need to read statistics done wrong. It's really gonna help you to interpret published articles. And that's something that any PhD candidate has to do. They, they want you to go out and they want you to demonstrate an ability to read and comprehend a scientific publication because that's gonna affect your career path, your career trajectory. Because you need to be able to understand what's actually good science and what's bad science. And this implies that they want you to be able to do that this implies that there is bad science on paper, published, printed, and even in uh, uh, well-established, respected journals. Go read this book, Statistics Done Wrong, and then uh, the author has provided a great list of references. Go and find some of those articles and some of these uh, overviews of the field and read through those too, because that's very educational. Uh, for me, it was uh, well worth the time spent and uh, it emphasizes the need to understand the proper application of statistics. So this is the man from Avesto, and this has been uh, a list of 10 things that atheists don't seem to care about and ought to uh, take much more seriously and you ought to uh, consider when you're going to discuss things with Christians or if you're going to uh, oppose the idea that God is real, that eternity is real, that eternal life is real, these are things that you need to understand, that you ought to research, that you ought to have a, a significant grasp of if you want to 
you know, participate in the interesting part of the conversation, of the dialogue between atheists and Christians. So this is the man from Modesto, reminding Christians as always to pray or be defeated. Peace.